Hello and welcome to Reflections. I'm Rom Gayoso, your host. Today, our topic is competitive intelligence and boy, do I have the right person to speak with you. First and foremost, thank you so very much for your being here with me and my guest today. I know your time is very important. I am, I am the guy who will make sure it is invested wisely. And remember, if you're watching the show via Futures Television, the home of the future on television, or listening to the show via Radio Futures, the wave of the future on radio, you too can be part of the conversation. Please join us in our YouTube channel, that is IMCI Magazine, where we're going to continue to talk about the chat and continue to chat about the topic of the day. So uh, let's get going. My guest today is very special. It's Babette Pinsusan. And let me say a few words about her before uh, we really get started. You know, she's a decision-making maverick at uh, Mind Chiefs. You know, she's a life leadership and business coach, competition and strategy specialist, author of so many books, I can't possibly count them all, but, you know, at least improving your life, decision-making and the competitiveness of your business. So without further ado, let's welcome Babette to the show. How are you doing today? Good, thank you, Rom. Lovely to be with you this morning. Well, this morning for me is it? It's afternoon for you, isn't it? Well, you're. Uh, it's um, it's magic because I'm talking with someone from the future. I'm I, I'm right. from the past, technically speaking. <laughs> That's right. Well, I can tell you that tomorrow's going to have you're going to have beautiful weather tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow's going to be a beautiful day. Okay, see That's you guys. You know, there is benefit of watching television. You know what's going to happen tomorrow for sure. She's in the future. She's telling us what's happening tomorrow. So there's exactly. something uh, for us to know. And so thank you so very much for your taking the time to speak with me. I've been trying to talk for the longest time. And of course, you're in Australia. I'm in the U.S. So it takes a little bit of, of homework for us uh, to get uh, the time Go zone. Right. <laughs> well, but so. I want to uh, start uh, basically uh, from the beginning. And I wanted to hear a little bit about your journey. How oh, did you gosh. get? Where to start? And I do have an hour. I can listen. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, you want my journey in competitive intelligence? Yes. Okay. I've always been very passionate about strategy. For some reason, strategy appeals to me. And I was very fortunate. I was working for Apple in the 1980s. And they did some really interesting things. Um, Steve Jobs did not allow us, any Apple place, to do any research on customers. It was forbidden to do any customer research because I think he came from the perspective that customers don't know what they want. They'll say a different color or a bigger widget, but they really don't know what they want. They're never going to predict the future. Let me but ask when... you a question before you get there. So I was in for 15 years at Intel and said there was an engineering culture as well. And other companies that, you know, the engineers know for sure what the customers want. We'll make it and therefore they will buy it. So that's kind of hard. So uh, he had this mindset where, uh, you know, we don't need to talk to the customer. You will come up with it and they will buy. I, I think, you know, it, it, it really depends. So what he did, and this is what led me on to my journey of competitive intelligence, mm -hmm. is that what Apple was interested was what that was coming down the track, trends. They were far more interested instead of, customer research, they were much more interested in stuff like psychographics. So psychographics is the psychology of consumer groups um, and what they're likely to behave. So one of the leading uh, psychographics um, people that I follow is a woman called Faith Popcorn, who uh, is out of the US, out of New York. And she's a great psychographic person. She's written some fabulous books called The Popcorn Report and Clicking. Anyway, so I learned there at Apple that it's not about what's happening now. It's about the trends and things that are coming down the pipeline. So I thought, wow, you know, that's so important for strategy. And then when I was doing my MBA, uh, someone said, well, a professor said to me, have you looked at competitive intelligence? And I said, no, what's that? 
So I then started to go in the 1990s. I kept going to uh, SCIP conferences. SCIP is a, a strategic and competitive intelligence professionals uh, in the US, and they regularly run conferences. So I went, I started to learn. I did the course at the Academy of Competitive Intelligence. And then I started to, I was, I set up my own consulting practice in the area of competition and strategy. And uh, after about six, seven years of doing this constantly, I started to present. Uh, I learned new things. And then uh, I wrote uh, a couple of books with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Craig Fleischer, and it was very successful. And uh, yeah, and here we are the rest is 30 history. years later. <laughs> And the rest is history, of course. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, did you did you feel you know, and you had the opportunity to work with so many of the largest companies in the world? Uh, did you feel so? We we tend to focus a lot on you know the soft skills nowadays, right? We we tend to focus a lot on empathy, and I, I know you're one of the people that you know really values the soft skills quite a lot. But, you know, over the course of time and working in, in so many different companies, uh, did you feel uh, differences, cultural differences? Or do we go about doing competitive intelligence about the same way in Australia and the U.S.? Or our practices are slightly different? I, when I started CI, it was really very interesting because... In the 1990s and 2000, Western countries were very strong on collecting the hard information and quite weak in soft skills. The Asian countries, on the other hand, were very good at soft skills but had dreadful hard data <laughs> that was really useless. So now with where we are today, the hard data with AI, what we can search, what we can find is, is essentially global now. So I think soft skills are becoming very important because I think people are also becoming quite cynical. There is, there is so much misinformation out there that if you do not have and do not collect human information or human intel, as we call it, you, then you're only doing half the job. You're not getting the real insights that you need. Yeah, we so, do have a little bit, on, a little bit of OSINT, a little bit of human, a little bit of social media intelligence. I think we, we need all of the, the intelligence put together, don't we? I, I'm always wary now of anything I read on social media. So I have uh, a couple of sources that I go to that I trust a bit more. There's Bellingcat, which are uh, a very good uh, newsletter, but they tend to be a little bit more focused to the military um, while an espionage. Well, we need to be much more focused on business. So, um, and, and there are some journalists Quillette is a, a great uh, newsletter that really gives you in-depth articles. And, and I search for journalists and people who do in-depth work. I really don't follow much on social media um, in my work. Um, so I, I'd rather speak to the people. I'd rather speak to a person than see. So, yes, I might get a name on social media. So mm -hmm. let's say I want to talk about uh, magazines and the future of magazines. And, and Rom, you're an expert. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't mind what you put on social media, but I would rather have a conversation with you as to where right you see them. magazines mm -hmm. going in the future, where you see the future of podcasts, where you and that would then shape 
my report on how someone needs to move forward or make a decision. Yeah, I really had, a, you know, um, several, not one, but several shocks uh, as I moved from blogs into magazines. I, 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 I will be very honest with you. I, I was of the impression uh, that people, you know, would open the magazine and, and just go page by page like, like I used to, right? Oh, baloney. Well, that's what I thought. So wake up, right? So I realized that, you know, people don't. Uh, they go and thankfully they, they read the letter to the editor, but they go straight to the index. And from the index, they go to what they want to read. Mm. Exactly what interests them. And I think part of the, the, the mission, I think, of the media today is to kind of understand exactly, you know, what the, the, the reader wants to read and bring her this information, right? Uh, not try to you know dance around around the issues, but you know for me it was was a very interesting experience, uh, and of course I had this old view of uh, you know we will well I I I still do that actually I smell the magazines I open them I smell them I smell my books too they smell great, and and I go through page by page. But, but now do you know what's yeah. interesting, Rom? What is interesting? What you're saying? They have. Neuro um, scientists have been working with the brain about retention and knowledge and learning. And what they've found, and, and I use this in my coaching practice with my clients. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll never forget the lecture um, from a, a well known brain scientist out of San Francisco. And he, they did a study where they gave they gave a thousand people a murder story. Okay. 500 got to read it on a piece of paper. Okay. But 500 read it online. Okay. So they wanted to see the difference. The 500 people who read it on a piece of paper, they found had better retention of the story over a longer period of time. They had better recall of the relationships between the characters and they understood the story a lot better than people who read it online. Well, now, is it because we, 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 we touch it and we, we scribble and... Correct. But the thing is that what, we they've, they've, yeah, what they've found is that if you want to learn, you need to get a pen and write something down, you will have greater retention because there is something that goes from the pen to the eye to the brain, yeah, far more than if you type it in on your computer. Yeah, I, I, I'm one of those. I, I, I make Me too. Scribbles, you know, and I, I, I usually do not lend my books because they have scribbled everywhere. You know how they many highlighters I have. I'm the same. I print my stories. I print things out because I need Babette, to. Read. A lot of people want to say hi to you. So Daniela in Sao Paulo is saying hi. Uh, Arthur hi. In, in, in the UK is saying hi. Actually, he has a question for you. He he also loves human intelligence, but he's kind of worried. Aren't you worried about bias and groupthink as we use human intelligence? What are your thoughts? Are we? Arthur, bothered? that is always, Arthur, that is such a great question, as you know. No, I, I'm not. When you speak with diverse groups, I think you then start to limit group think. The problem that you have is the personal biases that you bring to a project. And that I think is what is dangerous. But hopefully you try as an intelligence uh, person to get um, diverse points of view. The, the thing is that Remember, you start off with the people that are inside the company, what their thoughts are, what they've heard. Then you spread out. You then go to, um, you might go to customers, suppliers, distributors. Then you go out. You might go to academics who 
monitor the industry industry associations so hopefully a uh, librarian you you might speak to uh, futurists so hopefully you're going to limit the group think that might be present but the key is my concern is always the bias you as an individual bring to a project where you will not ask or hear contrary opinions yeah actually i am very worried about that i mean i i asked myself of my biases and i i write them down you know when as i start any project i write it out and say well those are my biases you know what if i'm missing the boat is because you know but nowadays, you know, Babette, I wanted to get your advice here. So I think part of the problem that I uh, we see here today is that, you know, a lot of people just bypass the, the bias statement and it, it's not, no longer a piece of the report. And people have so many biased opinions and biased perspectives uh, and people basically hear what they want to hear. They read what they want to read. They say what they want to say. So and they're not the, in competitive intelligence. Correct. Then, but, then you're not in competitive intelligence. I don't know what industry you're in or what project you're doing, but it's not competitive intelligence. So what is your advice? So, uh, you know, it's very difficult to speak truth to power. And so many, especially of the junior analysts, they will go in and, yes, they're their way in. And this is, you know, that, this is the storyline. This is the party line. This is the company line. That's what they say. They don't want to speak truth to power. So what is your advice? How can we instill this confidence from the people who are coming in to say, no, actually, thou shall you know, speak you know, truth to power? I'll never forget. Um, I think it was in the Academy of Competitive Intelligence where the discussion was about this very issue and what was said was it is not your job to tell a senior decision maker what to do your job is to bring unbiased information with options for the leader to make that's why the leader is being paid millions of dollars and you're not it is not your job to make the decision for the leader. Your job as an intelligence uh, person is to provide the executive options based as a result of your analysis, as a result of the information you've collected. See, that's why they get paid thousands of dollars. It's not. Millions of dollars, I should say. But uh, you made another very, very important point in there because I think we can't just walk in, in, into the theater, uh, theater and yell fire, right? We okay. have to say, okay, there's a fire. And by the way, there's a hose here. Oh, is it a chemical fire? Well, we have chemical powders. Oh, oh we, we have water. We have you know, CO2. So we have to come up with options and alternatives and, and pathways. Good analogy. And, and present, right? We, we can't just come in and say, fire you know th there's a problem and then we you know if we're the the problem person they will see us as a problem right so what is the value right we have to as you pointed out we have to come in and think about the options and the alternatives and point it out of course the decision maker you, you know she will she will make the decision but we we did our job we thought about the Correct. alternative and we presented and them. that's what a lot of people get wrong in ci that i see regularly they say how do i get the decision maker to listen to me that's not your job your job is to listen to the problem of the decision maker and help that decision maker with the issue it's not for you to turn to the decision maker and say um this is what uh you know you've got to do that's not your job your job is to help the decision maker address an issue that the decision maker is facing and that's why most competitive intelligence people don't clearly identify up front what is the decision to be made so someone says oh i want you to tell me about my competitors 
Well, go to a librarian. If you want a CI person, what is the issue? Let me give you, a, I tell this so many times, a classic story. The managing director of a waste service business called us in and said, I want you to tell me who's who in the zoo in waste oil. Okay. And I thought, oh, my God, a question like that. So I said to the managing director, what decision will you be making with this information? And the MD turned round and said to me, well, I want to know, should I enter waste oil recycling? So I then said to him, well, what would make you enter waste oil recycling? And he said, well, if I can achieve an ROI, a return on investment of 18% in three years, I'll be interested. Now, the first story is, who's who in the zoo in waste oil? All you're going to give that person is you're not going to help it with the decision because you don't know what it is. So what you're going to do is, like most CI people who ha don't understand, they'll run off, collect the name of all the competitors and give them the list. Now, how has that helped that decision maker make a decision? It hasn't. But now that I know he wants to enter waste oil recycling, he wants an ROI of 18% in three years, I now know I need to look at the viability of his business entering the market. I have to look at the profitability of the industry. I have to see what new technology might be coming down the pipeline. I have to look at what the suppliers are doing in the industry. All of a sudden, I know. And the answer, he didn't like it. He wasn't happy with us, um, was that unfortunately the industry was in decline because the suppliers were teaching customers how to reuse their waste oil. <laughs> so, but, but there that's, was YouTube. That's why I love speaking with you is because you just told me how to present my own ROI, right? So if I'm the the, the CI analyst and the, I was asking, you know, what are the names of the uh, used oil in the zoo? And I give an answer I can put in my, my you know, my my resume well i i gave you the names of the people who recycle oil that's that, that has no value versus oh, i understood what your need was and i help you make a real decision whether or not you're going to enter this this market or this opportunity so i think you know this is this is that's what we, that's where the real difference is between the successful professionals like yourself and the others who are not because they come in and say and they answer without asking questions and they don't know why they're doing things versus you took the time to understand what the real problem is and what ah. would it take to and so you can clearly estimate okay this is my value and i think that's the biggest criticism we as professionals encounter is we don't know what's the value of ci and, and that and rom you are so right the key the key step i think for any competitive intelligence person is always to ask the decision maker, what decision will you be making with this information? If the decision maker cannot answer that question, then just grab the work, give it to a librarian, or you know they'll provide the answers and you can give it back. But you need to tell the decision maker that your value is to support their decision making. And if you can't support their decision making, then you've got no value to the business. And that's why CI units that are data warehouses and, you know, do battle cards all the time don't win. Actually, that, that's that's so, I mean, I never worked there. And so for me, it's hearsay. But that's the worst stories I hear from people that work at Apple is that jobs would, if you run into him into the elevator, he quizzed people. So what exactly do you do here and what value do you bring? <laughs> so people are terrified of entering the elevator with him, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, he was very, he was not a very good leader. He really, Jobs was not a good people leader. Not a people person. Not no, a real he wasn't. Person. But he was a great futurist in looking at products, in understanding uh, technology and what was coming down because of people's, psychology you know of what the communities you know 
Faith Popcorn, when she wrote her book, The Popcorn Report, in the 1980s, talked about a thing called um, cocooning. And what she said is that people are frightened about the future. And as a result of the fear of the future, um, what's going to happen, the increase in crimes and wars and everything, people are going to become much more cocoon. So remember, she wrote this book in the 1989, cocooning. And she said, so as a result of this psychographic thing of people holding in and, and, and being worried about the outside world, you're going to see far more uh, enclaved, enclosed communities, gated communities, that's the word, you're going to see a lot more of reality shows on TV. You're going to see a lot more of home. There's home renovations is going to go through the roof. And this was a woman who was predicting these trends in 1989. <laughs> Tell me. Wow. Is that correct? And well... that's, I think, where the iPhone came from. That's where the iPad came from. You know, that's where a lot of these ideas, if you go this way, if you think about future trends, you, you know, people don't, it's not about predicting. It's about understanding the psychology of consumers. And that's very, very different to demographics or customers saying, oh, well, what color would you like this pen in? You know, blue. Well, that doesn't That's help you. Hard. You can have any card as long as it's black, right? Black. Yeah. But see, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You know, if we don't, um, competitive intelligence is about helping executives to make decisions. So it's not per se predictive, but it's helping them to make decisions about what they're facing now. You know, you can use it for longer term decision making and strategies, like for scenarios. You know, there's a whole lot of options. We have to talk about money. So Arthur, and so he made a comment, you know, about, you know, when you're talking about Apple and says, you know, yeah. I agree, but you know, I wish I had the but that kind of budget on products. So talking about customers, right? So often it is, you know, ask the company. And when I say, you know, what about customers? Well, there's no budget. You know, we, we can't pay for, for, uh, for, uh, and, and Daniela is on the line. She's got a strong on me. I say, we cannot pay for, for, uh, user research or for, uh, consumer research. She's, she's going to jump in and, and squeeze my neck in any second. But <laughs> yeah, so people uh, do say that in terms of, but there is, there is no budget, right? When, so, so, explain to me a little bit more there's no budget for the ci or there's no budget to do the customer research Yeah, for the customer research and i, I think it's important you know what I, I think it's this is a very good point and, I, and arthur always raises this point in terms of budget you know when you start our ci products i always ask so what is the budget we have to say there's no budget then you know uh, google it uh, but if you really want uh, a professional to engage right we need you know we're going to have expenses. We're going to have, we need a budget. We need to commit. You know, I always try to sit down in project management terms and explain, well, this is going to take, you know, you know, 40 hours for this to 10 hours for that. So I think it's good discipline for us as CI professionals to inform the decision maker. Yes. Well, this is going to cost X many hours. This is going to cost X many dollars, right? We should do our best. So let me, let me ask this. Are you talking about bringing in a consultant or are you talking about an employee? No, as an employee. So, for example, as an hey. internal employee, I always told them, look, this, you know, costs, you know, 40 hours for this. So, uh, like a benchmarking study. Well, that is not going to be done overnight. That takes, you know, X many steps. You're now talking about time versus budget. Mm -hmm. If you're an employee, they've already allocated a budget. It's your salary. <laughs> So there is a budget because they've put you down as an employee. Yeah. But what you're saying is additional budget to pay for additional things. So yeah. most companies will allow you to network, will have memberships that you can leverage 
Um, there, there's a whole lot of things. You just have to learn to be a little smarter. When they hire consultants, there is always a budget for the consultant. Absolutely. And it is up to the consultant to allocate the cost of different elements. And then the client can delete or accept all these different elements, you know, bring the cost down or not. But, you know, um, as an employee, what you're doing is you're saying, oh, well, let me outsource it. Customer research. Why? What's the decision that the executive needs to make? Why do you need to outsource anything? That's your job. You're being paid to do it. So my question is, what is the intelligence question that you're being given? What analytical tool are you doing? Then go and do your research. Look at your hard data. Don't Google. Please don't just Google it. You know, read documents. Look at scientific papers. You know, do your work and then Go and interview people. Go and talk to people. Go to marketing networks. Okay, you might borrow $10, $20 out of petty cash to take someone to coffee. Or maybe you're going to borrow $150 out of petty cash to take someone to lunch. And there'll be phone calls. Do your work. There's no budget needed. So, well, there is. you do need a little budget, but it depends. But you don't have to go big. It can be done within the constraints of the work, right? We can do yeah, that. You're an employee. So employees will have their salaries. They'll have a little bit maybe for marketing. Let, you know, other members in the company might be part of a group. You can go with them to a function. That's how you start. Actually, you know, it's a great idea to do Delphi panels. They're experts in the company. You can probably get someone from engineering, someone from marketing, someone from production, right? We can always find ways. Can I tell you, Ron, one of the key things I've learned, and it was said that 70% of the information, not the intelligence, but the information you need to answer a decision maker's question is already locked in the company. It's just talking to the people in the company. Like you said, Unlocking you it. engineer, you'll go and talk to the marketing person. You'll go and talk to somebody else in the company. Because all these people in the company, they have two ears. So they are on Zoom calls. They might go to conferences. They might go to networking events. They'll hear speakers. They'll hear things. Start collecting what's internal. The advantage is that whatever you collect internally gives you a solid footing for questions you need to ask when you go outside the company. The other thing is that you've collected most of the information you need before you start talking to people outside the business. So you'll know if someone is throwing you a furphy. You know, by that I mean something that's not true or they're trying to trick you because you've done your research you'll know you'll know what questions to ask and remember you've already got 70 percent of the information you need you're only looking for missing pieces so instead of going out and saying oh look i'm doing a project for a client on waste oil can you tell me about the waste oil industry you've already got some information and you're going to say I hear that the uh, sales in uh, waste oil are dis declining due to environmental factors. How have you experienced that? So I haven't asked him the question, but I'm trying to validate the decline in sales of waste oil. If there is a decline in sales, then my client won't be able to grow his revenues by 18%. Good. He won't get a return on investment. So... I don't ask about the industry. I ask specific questions when I go outside the business. We do have questions about, and I think we talk a little bit about uh, predictive, but you know, predictive and prescriptive intelligence is important when you deliver competitive intelligence projects. 
mainly to uh, the directors in attendance, I believe. So do you think analysts are producing that analysis so the lower level people are producing the analysis? Daniela, no. <laughs> no. Because the moment no one, the moment information is not collected externally to an organization, you are sticking to your bias and groupthink which was what Arthur raised earlier. You have to speak to people outside the organization first. Secondly, what analytical tool? The amount of so-called competitive intelligence that I've received, and I just ask a simple question. What analytical framework did you use? Oh, well, um, you know, we just pulled it together and we looked at this and the rate. What analytical framework did you use? Because I'll tell you the key trick that I learned. I've done over 350 client projects on CI, customer projects. The one thing that saved my bacon every time was my analytical tool, my analytical framework. I said, this is the framework we are going to use this is how we're going to collect the information and this is what we're going to do. And uh, the directors just go, oh, good, good, you know, and they're fine. When I yeah, do, yeah. go on. Yeah, so I, I think you raised yet another another, another important point here she was thinking of, but uh, really uh, I try to remind people of methodologies. So why do we use research methodologies? Why do we use competitive intelligence methodologies? Because otherwise it's just the size of people's bellies. Be Correct. People and that's your bias. Opinions. Yeah. That's Other people have opinions, but we are professional analysts. We have professional. We have to give them the, uh, this is our pro professional perspective. So we don't just go off and, and well, I, I, I Googled it. I found it on, on, a, on some, some website. We had a method, we, we checked, we double checked, we, we beat it around a little bit. The method is sound, it will produce a decent answer. It can be reproduced by somebody else and they will yes. arrive at approximately the same conclusion. That's, what, that's our obligation, correct? Correct. That's what we have to do as professionals. It, it's so funny. When I have done analysis, so one of the tools I use a lot, I've used a lot is industry fusion analysis. And it's a technique that combines porters, five forces and stick together. So when you lay it out, you've got to look at the weighting uh, of a force between two groups. I have never, ever, ever have any senior director question the information where I got it from in each box. Do you know what they argue over? The waiting. So yeah. let's say I say, oh, well, I we thought that this force was a 7 out of 10. No, 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 no. It's an 8 out of 10 or it's a 9 out of 10. No question asked about the information, where it was sourced. It's the waiting. When you do driving forces analysis, again, how did you come to that particular weighting? You know, no, 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 it's a five. Oh, we don't think it's that strong. And so then you've got your information to back up why you did that weighting of that force. All of a sudden, you end up having credibility. But when you don't have the information to back up weightings or what you did because you don't have a framework, they can shoot you through the water. You know what? I, I will share a um, our story. Yeah. So um, at that time, I I created a different forecast for for revenues, and a very senior person um, wanted to see it. And everybody between that person and me said, you know, are you sure you're gonna tell her? Are you really sure? Because it, it, that's that's against the party line. You know what? She she greeted me. She said, is this your opinion or is it the output of your research? Or was the output Good. of your research? And then she says, oh, okay. Did you, did you trust the research? What was the method? We talk about the methodology. And you know what she said? 
go ahead and say it. Yeah. You know what? If it were your opinion, you know, oh, get out of here. But all that you wanted to do is to test, to make sure. Did you Correct. do the homework? Did you do Correct. the research? Do you know what you're talking about? You actually do? Okay, go ahead and say it. And, so and, the, and then once they know that you've got a solid methodology, you've got a solid process that you followed, and it's not your opinion, they trust you then with more serious decisions. So I've had clients that over time uh, I was mentoring a competitive intelligence unit in a very large mining company. And over time, it was the unit that was predicting where the next drills would be going. Now, you know, that's billion dollars worth of expenses to put a drill for oil. But the CI put unit in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, but they used the CI unit. They used the CI unit to look after the drilling platforms, where it was safe, where it wouldn't have any terrorist issues. There was a whole lot of things. When you drill out in the ocean, you need to make sure that you're drilling in good places with the engineers, but also places that are safe, that are not um, of a threat. The weather, there's a whole heap of things. I've got um, other projects where we did it for one company. We did three or four projects for them. And in the end, they, they came to us and said, we're looking to buy a company uh, that does frozen pizza dough. Who should we buy? And we told them exactly why they should buy this company. But we did the research. The culture was a fit. The revenues were there, you know. But it you took know. time. It but wasn't. I, I, I'm project. glad you are reinforcing this. And actually, you know, Daniela and, and she created the, the review methodology as well. But I think it's important that we reinforce this that you just said in terms of we don't come in with, you know, guesswork. We're not guesstimating. We're not Googling. We are actually using methodologies. We're using research methodologies. We use competitive intelligence methodologies. The methodologies Absolutely. are sound. And I think the real benefit is, you know what? If it's published, then all of the intelligence community will poke at it and yeah. remind you, well, did you think of this? Did you think of that? And it will be better, right? Yes. Work. Correct. Correct. And as I said, you know, whatever is published be very wary. The other thing is that, for example, what concerns me is that on Google, you'll never get, you know, on the first page of Google, which is what most people look at, you'll never get your scientific papers come up. You'll never get um, real valuable scientific documents because some of these scientific documents are written by experts that you could pick up the phone and say, I read your paper on um, waste oil, let's say, and I'm very curious to understand you said in your paper X, Y, Z. Do you think people are going to hang up on you? They're not. They're going to want to talk to you, tell them what they thought. Hello, you're now filling out your method, your analytical method because you're getting information from people. It's, it's, it's not hard. It takes work. And the problem is that a lot of people want the answer without the hard work. And I, I, I have a different kind of question. And you just mentioned uh, you've done over 350 different projects. And the question is about motivation. So uh, how do you motivate yourself? How do you start tomorrow and say, waste oil? How, how <laughs> How, how do you motivate yourself? I'm curious. I'm a very, very curious person. I I love, I'm curious, is waste oil. Oh, how fascinating. How does that industry operate? Oh, this is really exciting. Pizza dough. Wow. Is this where consumers are going in the future? Well, that would be interesting to find out. I'm curious. So you look at it as a puzzle, right? Yeah. It's a puzzle. It's 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 a play. Well point. said, Rob. Well said. Everything for me. All these projects are puzzles. You know, um, for example, 
you know, clinical trials. I wonder if that inhaler is working as effectively. Oh, that'd be interesting. Or um, where's the fu future of uh, pharmacies going? Doctors are overloaded. So what does that mean for the pharmaceutical industry with prescriptions? Oh, that'll be interesting. Oh, there's new glass companies, budget glasses. Yeah, people will want, well, look, you know, the government squeezing on Medicare and all that. I'm, fast. I'm curious. I think it makes uh, for things to be more interesting, but I, I tend to think of them as puzzles as well, because I, uh, you know, it kind of excites me if I think it's one of those, the, the round ones without corners, that like you don't know where it's going. And then it needs to exercise more brain power, right? So you have to think about it. You have to consider possibilities. And then I go and I, I ask around. Yeah. I go, you know, where can, you know, I have to poke a little bit deeper on this one because it's, I don't know much about waste oil. So maybe it's an opportunity for me to learn. Yeah. It's a learning opportunity, isn't it? And and, and that's it. That's what I, I say. I, I'm Look, I'm curious. And I think because I'm a curious and I want to learn, I think that really makes a big difference on how you approach interviews, how you want to speak to people. It's not, I, I don't come across as, I want you to tell me things. I come across as, I'm very curious. I want to share what I've seen or what I've read. Am I on the right track? Or, you know, it's a puzzle. I want pieces of the puzzle as opposed to, you're an expert. Tell me. Tell me what, right? So you have exactly. to. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Exactly. But you know what? Uh, and I think, and, and Arthur is on the call with us, but he's is when, it's the only person I know who could get me ex excited of a Morse code. He had a, a escape room exercise once and he used Morse code. I said, only you could make me think of Morse code in an exciting way. But it is it is uh, that ability uh, to look at something that you know perhaps is not as exciting. Perhaps you know when you look at you know used cooking oil, for example, you know that what is that? Not as exciting. But when you think about what is the business model and how uh, will my decision maker use this information to make a real decision, you either make money or lose money or prevent the person from losing. Correct. Money. Then it Correct. becomes something else, right? It's no longer the, the used oil. It becomes Absolutely wrong. The business, right? And, 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 and I agree with you. I think this is the whole issue is if you're curious, then you will keep learning. Um, and, and particularly if you try to understand it from the decision maker's point of view, what is the decision that's being made? Okay, so he wants to increase the ROI of the business. Yeah. This is exactly what Arthur was saying. What is the decision? <laughs> I, I, you know, this is an interesting conversation because, you, you, and by the way, folks, she didn't see it because only I have the, the visibility to what people are yeah. saying and then I show it to her. So she did not yeah. see it. She yeah. was saying it and uh, as she was saying, uh, he was stopping it. But yes, I think that's the key. So what it, is the decision? It, and that's what so few... Uh, competitive intelligence people have clarity. They take away a job without the clarity of the decision being made. And that the, if you do not have a clear uh, idea of the decision that's being made, um, then your project is, is, is going to be doomed to a great extent. If you have a clear idea of the decision, then you have every chance of having a successful project. I do have to go somewhere that I go with every single person I talk to because I think it's needed. So actually, my last talk was with Jonathan Kalaf, and we put uh, quite a lot of time talking about something because I think we 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 ought to. But about you know, and you've been doing this for for a while. So about you know, collecting competitive intelligence in an ethical way. So yes. we, we're, we're not spies. We're not all, you know, extracting information at all costs. But I wanted to hear your thought in terms of the importance of keeping it above ground, let's say, in, in terms of the importance of you know, 
ethics in our profession? So I speak to people when I speak to a third party to collect information, I'm looking for missing pieces of my jigsaw puzzle. Remember, I've said to you, I've already spoken to people in-house. I've done all my reading. So I've done things internally. And hopefully I've got 70% of what I need, roughly. So if I'm going outside to speak to people, I'm very clear on the specific information I'm looking for. And I'm happy, more than happy to share any of the documents that I've collected from the public domain. So I will say to the person, like I said earlier, I read your paper on waste oil and I'm fascinated to read about X, Y, Z. Um, what were your thinking? Where did you get this from? Okay. Or I might say to someone in the public domain, um, I'm curious to know where you're going with this because I read a paper by the government on X. Let me share it with you. Happy to give you a copy of this government paper. It's in the public domain. Don't. But they know who I am. I will say straight out, my name is Babette Bensusen and I'm from the Mind Shifts Group. And I'm doing a project on waste oil. I read your paper on this. I'd love to talk to you about it. Can I have 10 minutes of your time? I never lie about who I am. I never tell them who the client yeah. is either. But I think it's important that we we say those things that, you know, oh. especially for the people who are walking through the door or they're asking themselves, you know, no, we don't use fake badges. No, we don't hide behind the the, the pillar and try to listen to people's conversations. That That's the spy, not that that's not us. Yeah, We're not that's, and Jonathan is excellent on trade show intelligence. Yeah. His books on how to collect information in an ethical way, trade shows, best out there. Well, so you did mention, you know, and we talked a little bit about Google, but, you know, Arthur was mentioning, yeah, we do, you know, people do just skim the surface, right? They just touch the first page and what's on the first page, uh, whatever the algorithm wanted to show you what's on the, what is on the first page, right? But again, you know, doing the standard or sense searches, you know, uh, if, you know, if we're wasting a time if we're just looking at, you know, the first page of Google and, and, and moving on. And I think it's important that we explain to people we don't just look at the first page of Google. And even when you're doing a Google search, right, you, you're you going to be thorough, right? Yeah. Let me say one of the things I've mentored a lot of startup CI units in organizations. And the first thing I always, always recommend is getting a professional librarian on board. So they know how to search the invisible web. So we need to understand the difference between the dark web and the invisible web. So the, the invisible web. web, and Arthur is one, is a very good <laughs> uh, researcher on the invisible web. I've learned a lot from Arthur. <laughs> so did I. But Things that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> same. And the other person that I learned a lot from uh, about the invisible web is a woman called Mary Ellen Bates. Um, who's very, very good. So the first thing I always do is I never Google, I never use anything on my computer search engine. I take my decision and what my client is looking for and I give it to the librarian. I say to the librarian, I want you to collect as much information as you can on the issues in waste oil over the next five years. So she knows she's got a time frame. She's looking about waste oil and she will throw everything at me because it is my job to sort it out and learn. Then I will say, okay, I noticed in this article, the journalist referred to a paper written by CSIRO or a, a, a very well-known research scientific research organization. Can you get hold of the paper for me? Now we start working together and I start building out the model. But the first, first port of call, once I have a decision, what is the decision to be made? I go straight 
to uh, information. I call them information brokers nowadays. I think that's what they're called. Librarians who are the experts on searching the internet. I've learned a couple of tricks. Um, a classic is um, you visit a website, let's say, to see what they have there. And there is an opportunity of when you enter it into the search engine that you can go backslash link and it will tell you all the companies that are sponsoring or that they've linked to on their website without you having to look for it. And it tells you straight away. So we were looking at a um, Johnson & Johnson. We did backslash links and we got a university that was doing some uh, clinical trials for them, which is what we wanted. We wanted to know who, what. So we found it simply by ways you a enter. Backslash. backslash link or something. I can't remember. I haven't done it for a while. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I can share something with you because I, I'm a believer on, on librarians and uh, oh, let I me tell too. you why. So the first thing I did when I was looking, you know, what I'm doing in media, right? I said I looked for, you know, resources for independent media because that's what I am, right? And she said this here, that and the other. And I found a librarian in Ithaca University in New York. And she sent me so much information. And you know what? I suffered for several months because I didn't have the news. And I tried this and the other and the other news. And then she said, have you tried this outlet? Uh, because, you know, she looked everywhere. She says, have you tried this outlet? I said, no, as a matter of fact, I have not. You know, I am already online. They're going to uh, look at me as a competitor. They're not going to. She said, no, they won't. They will work with you, and uh, uh, here's the name, and here's the contact. And she gave me the entire thing, and I contacted the person, and, and the entity said, yes, and it's the Democracy News Network. And, yeah, they gave me the, the their news, you know, thanks to the librarian, really. I know. I've Seriously. had the same. I've had the same. You know, wonderful stuff from the librarians. And, and you know, it's just Arthur's very good at it, you know. Um, yeah. You know, he's saying that uh, that's it's the question. So 42 is the answer that the computer <laughs> deep thought gave to what's the meaning of life, universe, yeah. and everything. 42. Yeah. Though, Arthur, just I need five more. And I think Loro here is six numbers. So please, uh, I need five more. <laughs> yeah, 42 is um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Good. And that was the meaning. They, they asked the computer, what is the... The meaning of life and the answer was 42. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I don't know. If you know that uh, they turn off the, uh, the actually, the the two uh, Facebook robots, right? And the Elon Musk's robots were turned off too because they got together, they started talking, and they invented a new language that we didn't have a clue of what they were saying. <laughs> I think I heard that. Yeah, I think I it, it is actually true. Uh, uh, yeah. You know what? It's uh, we, scary. It is scary stuff, but, you know, and what is really scary is that we barely scratched the surface and we talked for an entire hour. I know. Oh, God, there's so much more to say. You have to promise you're going to come back. And we're I'd gonna love have to, to, Rom. I'd this, love to. As COVID. you can see, both of us can talk about this for hours and hours. So You know me. Uh, uh, so um, one last question. What are you reading? Can you recommend a good book? I have been reading the most fabulous books. The one I just read, finished reading, was one called Red Notice. And mm -hmm. it is a book by a gentleman called Bill Browder. Okay. Now, uh, Bill Browder was the first English-American to set up a hedge fund in Russia. And... Um, there were problems with Putin. A red notice is when Interpol issues a warrant against another against a person. And this is a true story. Um, so he it, it's fabulous book, fabulous book. Um, so I I'd recommend that. It's called Red Notice by Bill Browder, and then he's written a second one. And then for a light book, I've just finished reading Richard Osman's The Bullet That Missed. Okay. 
And that's from the Thursday Murder Club. So <laughs> that's good stuff. Yeah, they're interesting stuff. But then I'm also reading, uh, you know, Brene Brown's uh, The Atlas of the Heart and a couple. Of I, I, I am totally uh, cuckoo. I, I read like books. three books at the same time. Yeah, and, me too. and I, I don't know why. Maybe it's, you know, as I said, you know, too much sun in my head. I don't know. No, uh, no, but no, I, no, no. I like reading different books at the same time, you know. And I think that's because you and I have one thing in common. We're curious. We're curious about people. We're curious about things. And, and that's, you know, it was evident how you listened to what I've been saying, that you're curious, you know. We're curious about things and people. Oh, every, every person I encounter, I see it as an opportunity for me to learn. Yeah. As long as I'm talking, I'm not learning anything. The moment my mouth shuts and I'm listening, then I'm learning, you know. <laughs> I would have liked to have done a lot more of that on this call, but, you know, to learn from you. <laughs> oh, no, thank you so much. You know, uh, uh, folks, it's time for us to uh, say a few thank you. So thank you, Babette. Don't know how to thank you enough for uh, being here with me and the audience uh, today. Uh, we had uh, lots of participation, lots of questions, and they actually have more questions. Unfortunately, we don't have time to cover them all, but I'll, I'll be back to say a few more thank you so again but thank you so very much for for your being here with me and the audience today and you folks again thank you so much for being with us uh through the entire show uh again if you have any comments or questions please uh leave a comment or on our youtube page and that is imci magazine at youtube and i will make sure uh to bring the question to babette and i'm pretty sure she's gonna answer Again, thank you so very much, and I will see you again in another edition of Reflections. Thank you.